Thank you very much for this nice introduction. And thank you very much for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to give this talk. So good day to everybody. So you already heard what I was asked um, to talk about, and I couldn't find a more compelling title except for Evolution of Galaxies via EU projects, but I hope that my talk will make up for the non-creative title. So what I was planning actually to talk about is my career path. I started in Zagreb and I returned to Zagreb as a professor. And then about um, the galaxy evolution projects that I basically brought to Croatia. And I will finish out with outcomes and basically lessons learned from the projects that I led in Croatia. So from Zagreb to Zagreb. First of all, I studied physics in Zagreb. And in general, what I do is I study the evolution of galaxies. And I study the evolution of galaxies in the universe through an observational perspective where we use telescopes um, to do our observations. And we do this through large teams. So it's kind of like CERN. CERN is um, more famous, I guess, than the teams I uh, we in astrophysics work. It, our teams are not as big. So for example, one of my uh, major teams that I work um, in is called COSMOS. And it consists of about 200 scientists. Um, another team. I work in consists of about 100 members, and it's called the XXL team. And those two pictures that you have just seen are from the team meetings that we organized in Croatia um, in the last decade or so. So observational astrophysics that I do works in such a way that with all the major telescopes there exist, and here you see um, pictures of some of them, we want to observe a patch in the sky. So given that the instrumentation in astrophysics is so complex, it's basically not possible that one university alone would have a major telescope so good that it could reach the far distance of the universe. You have to use telescopes like the Hubble Space Telescopes um, or like the Very Large Array, which are million dollar projects. And those are usually or sometimes combined projects uh, between many, many countries. So all of these telescopes basically have open time that any scientists, uh, any, any astrophysicists in the world can apply for. And it's like a public call once or twice per year. You apply for time on a telescope. You ask for 400 hours or some orbits with the Hubble Space Telescope, for example. And then a committee decides whether your project is good enough to get the time on the telescope or not. So what we want to reach in observational astrophysics um, survey science that I do is basically to observe patches in the sky like outlined uh, here in the bottom left, um, to collect all the light from all the galaxies we can reach, but not only in the optical wavelengths that um, are observed by, for example, the Hubble Space Telescopes, Telescope, but through the whole electromagnetic spectrum, meaning X-ray light and radio wavelength light. And this this requires a lot of effort because it's a tremendous amount of proposals to get the telescope time. It's a tremendous amount of time and teamwork needed to reduce the data and then to produce final images like shown here, for example, for the ultra deep field. So it really um, requires a big team effort to collect all of the data first before we can start doing our science on it and use physics to deduce physical properties of our galaxies, like the rate at which they form new stars, the rate at which the supermassive black hole in the centers of galaxies basically um, gets fed by the gas that falls on it, and etc. So it requires a lot of team effort, a lot of time, investment. And my particular expertise in this context are radio wavelength observations that I collect with telescopes of this sort. And this is the very large telescope. Um, and for those that are my age or older, they will remember the VLA from the, the movie Contact with Matthew McConaughey and Jodie Foster. Sorry. 
So um, those are sets of antennas that collect data, basically light from galaxies, far galaxies in the universe. And then that light gets combined in a computer and I get it out in a file on a computer. So it takes a lot of time, a lot of skills to convert that data then to a final image. And this is in essence what I do, I'll come back to it. So how it all started. I finished physics in Zagreb. In 2004, I moved to Heidelberg to do my PhD at the Max Planck. Then I did my first postdoc at Caltech in Pasadena. I returned for my second postdoc back to Germany, to Bonn, where I did a postdoc combined between the European Southern Observatory and the Argelander Institute for Astronomy. And in 2013, I returned to Croatia again as a professor this time. So I started working on survey science, basically already for my diploma thesis in Croatia. I continued to work this time with radio telescopes during my PhD. Um, so already during my PhD, I gathered experience working with radio telescopes, which I continued then during my first postdoc at Caltech. And then I continued it again um, during my second postdoc in Germany. And the good thing about um, radio astronomy is that in the time when I was growing up as a scientist, the radio instrumentation was getting better, better, and better. So when I applied for my EU projects, it was really about the right time um, to apply for the funding because the radio instrumentation has increased in quality so much and I had projects uh, that I led with the data from those telescopes. So the time was really right for me to apply for funding based on data with these telescopes. So one other um, thing was, of course, that I was returning to Croatia. So as you saw, scientifically, I basically grew up outside of Croatia. Um, and returning to Croatia and knowing the funding situation in Croatia, plus bringing basically a completely new scientific topic to Croatia, um, galaxy evolution from an observational perspective was uh, not basically a science field in Croatia at that time. I knew that if I wanted to continue my um, scientific career as I had known it to then, that I would need to get some serious funding. So basically, 2012, the year before I returned to Croatia, I spent writing fi financing proposals. Um, I wrote some to some Croatian funding agency, Unity Through, uh, Unity Through Knowledge Fund, I wrote a Marie Curie career integration grant proposal, and I wrote an ERC starting grant proposal. And I remember that I literally, I think for six months or so, put my science yield on hold um, to focus on really writing the 30, paper, 30 pages per proposal of these proposals to get the text and the science case is right. So it was also quite a time effort um, that I invested, quite some time that I invested in this. So my Marie Curie proposal title, so its acronym was AGN Feedback and the title was Constraining AGN Feedback Through Cosmic Times, Paving the Way for Next Generation Radio Facilities. So um, this was within the FP7 um, project and the host institution for all of my proposals was the Faculty of Science, um, the Physics Department, University of Zagreb, and I was awarded the Career Integration Grant, which started in March 2013. That was 100,000 euros over a period of four years, and it was a flat rate. Some with uh, very uncomplicated administration associated with it, actually. And the ERC I applied for, so uh, the title is, I don't even know it by head, I always have to read it myself, Constraining Stellar Mass and Supermassive Black Hole, uh, black hole Growth Through Cosmic Time, again, paving the way for next generation sky surveys. So I applied for the starting grant in the same year, 2012, 
and due to some delays from the ERC side, I pushed the start of this project um, to February 2014, uh, which means that basically my ERC started about a year later than my career integration grant started. DRC in the end lasted for five and a half years and in total it was a million and a half euros spent on it. So, one of my biggest challenges, I think, before the start of the project, was actually to assemble a good science group that could um, do all of the tasks that I wrote we would do in the project. And this challenge was um, quite large because, as I said, it was a new field in Croatia. So there was basically um, no Croatian-based postdocs, for example, I could hire. It was essential for the project that I would collect an international team of young scientists. And in particular, those needed to be young, motivated, excellent, of course, people um, that were expert in this kind of science that I was doing. And this is radio wavelength astronomy, which is also a small part of astrophysics and astronomy in general. So the career integration grant really, really helped me to headhunt really people um, internationally to advertise the jobs that I knew I would um, I would offer in six months' time or so, and the, the, the ERC positions, basically. So I remember in 2013, when, I already, uh, when the Career Integration Grant project already started, I had the funding, um, I traveled like crazy. I went to every conference. I, I visited my colleagues in, in Germany, in the US, in Australia, and wherever I was, I advertised the ERC project and the open positions on the given topic. I had um, even a very nice colleague of mine <laughs> offered that he would mention the position after his talk at a, co at a conference that I didn't even attend myself. So um, I really did active headhunting to assemble um, the group that was in the end based in Croatia. And this excellent group that you see here um, is the essence of the success of um, both the career integration grant and um, the ERC projects. So my PhD students were Mladen. I don't think you can see the laser pointer, so Mladen is the tallest one um, to the right. So he started working um, with me already on the career integration grant project and then continued on the ERC project. Um, the first postdoc that arrived was Oskari, left of Mladen, um, from Finland who actually changed scientific topics, but uh, he was fantastic in working on a subject of so-called submillimeter galaxies. And then two other postdocs um, were Jacinta, to the right, uh, from Australia, who visited us in Croatia um, before accepting the position to see how it is in Croatia. It was, it was a big change. So it's, Croatia is a non-English speaking country and Jacinta finished all of her studies um, until then in Australia. So she was wondering how she was feeling Croatia. So we flew her to Croatia for a one week visit to see how it is here and to see whether she liked it or not. And it was the worst winter week you can imagine. So Jacinta is from Perth and there's like 300 days um, of sunshine during the year and it was the worst winter, winter week when she visited. But she liked the warmness and friendliness of um, Croatian people, of the team. Uh, so she said yes, which was excellent because she was really an expert in this niche that um, we were working in. And um, Ivan Del Vecchio, he's the second from the left, was an Italian-based um, postdoc uh, who did his first postdoc after his PhD um, with us and he turned out to be an expert also in one of the novel methods that we were developing, which was essential for the project. There was another postdoc who is not on this picture. She was based in Spain and she did a one, one and a half year postdoc, I think, um, with us. And the remaining people, Lana and Kreshmir, were the two youngest PhD students. So the PhD students were Croatians, the postdocs were international. And um, Yes, I really do have to say that I owe it to the Career Integration Grant, which allowed me to travel that much to assemble such a fantastic group, which is 
definitely the essence of the success of the projects. So let me tell you a little bit more about the projects that we were scientifically working on here in Croatia within the group that you have already seen. And uh, not only within the group, so we were the Croatian-based core team doing the science, but our closest collaborators were the larger radio team within the Cosmos and the XXL collaborations, which was international. Those consisted of about 15, 20 people in total, counting us as well. And this was a subgroup within the big teams, Cosmos and XXL, of about 100 to 200 people that we were overall working with. So, as said, I studied the evolution of galaxies through cosmic time, basically how galaxies are born, how they evolve. And um, a big constituent of, of these um, studies concretely is how the stellar mass grows, how gas in galaxies is converted to stars in galaxies, and how the biggest supermassive black holes that are in the centers of galaxies grow, so how they assemble their mass. So this sort of justifies the title of my ERC project. And the open questions that were open at the time was, what is the effect of cosmic dust? Yes, there is cosmic dust. It's not really like dust um, around us. Um, it's little... Uh, grains of silicate and carbon, um, which make an observer's life very hard because they attenuate light. So the question, the big, big question for observational astronomers was how does dust actually affect the assembled light in the earliest phases of the universe, when the universe was really, really young? And how um, do supermassive black holes the radiation influenced the growth of stellar mass because there seems to be some feedback process which, is, which was very poorly understood at that time. So in particular, I'm coming back now to the ripe time to propose the projects that I was awarded uh, being an expert in radio wavelength observations. So radio wavelength observations have, in terms of these two questions that I showed on the previous slide, um, major advantages. So first of all, they're insensitive to the dust that makes an astronomer's life hard. So if you observe in, in radio wavelengths, you basically see through the dust. They're directly sensitive to a special kind of galaxies with supermassive black holes who are actually thought to influence the growth of stellar mass. So basically see directly into this population of galaxies as well. And as I already mentioned, within the maybe five, six years, or maybe a decade, before I applied, uh, not a decade, five, six years, before I applied for the project, the, the radio instrumentation was really upgraded significantly. So for example, um, the upgrade of the very large array shown here in the middle was such that um, it performed 10 times better than previously. So in my project, I showed the benefit of the data that I was principal investigator on in this diagram. So on the y-axis, you see depth of a survey. A survey means collecting data of all the galaxies in a patch of the sky, being small or larger. So the deeper, the better. That means that you see the earlier and earlier and earliest phases of the universe. And on the x-axis, so depth increases towards the bottom. On the x-axis, you see the area. The bigger area, the better the survey. So when you compare what had been done prior to my application um, to the EU projects, the surveys that existed in literature occupied this top um, left part of this diagram. And at the same time, new instruments were planned the square kilometer array, maybe you heard of it, um, which came to existence basically only now. Not even now are there in um, full force, um, and we're now in 2021. So at the time I wrote my projects, the new surveys um, that were planned, um, of course it was all delayed, <laughs> so after 2016, um, were about to occupy the bottom right part of this diagram. And I think I showed the state of the art of the data that we were collecting um, on the, the upgraded telescopes by the two surveys that I was principal investigator in. Um, so this is sort of the basics why 
these projects that I proposed um, were timely to be done when they were proposed for. So one of the big projects, and if I go back, that's the uh, red bottom left one, the JVLA Cosmos Survey, um, was collecting data with a very large array, the array of antennas here, for close to 400 hours in total. So that's more than two consecutive weeks of observations towards a field that is cosmos. It's shown in the top left there. And it's, if you were to imagine the full moon and put three times three full moons in a square, that's the size of our cosmos field. And um, well, applying for the data on this open call was hard. So first time we were rejected. The second time we got the best grade and we were awarded the time. But they said to us that given that um, the upgraded instrument is not really that known, we'll give you first 10% of the time, and you show us that you can really reach the limits that you said in the proposal you could reach. So we were working like crazy to show after the first 10% of the data was assembled that we can actually do with the data that we said we would do. Then they gave us the rest. And the rest was collected over two years, I think. So it took some years to get the data approved, to get the data assembled, and then the other challenges started. And those were reducing this complex data set with the upgraded instrument for the first time over such observations. So you use some software tools, and the VLA exists. It's all this exactly as I am. Uh, so it existed for a long time, and there was a software that had been used well known. But with the upgraded VLA, the software was changing as well. So the old software was not applicable to all of the new problems, and the new software was not developed enough to be applicable to the new, some of the new problems. So we had some um, challenges that we had to overcome with the data when we started to reduce it. So it took um, some more years, I don't remember, two, maybe, maybe even longer to, get, to crunch through all of the problems and to get the final mosaic and then to test it and then to identify all the galaxies within the mosaic. So it was really a multi-year project um, with full, FF, uh, full, fine, full time equivalents of all the people in the group in Zagreb, but also this core team international of about 15 people who actually worked on the data. So the radio mosaic of the biggest um, project like this looks like that. And that's a little bit disappointing because a radio map always looks like a black box. Um, if you're used to some astronomy images, those are those beautiful galaxies in different various colors. And this is the best radio image out there. It looks like a black box. But I do assure you there is 11,000 sources, um, 11,000 galaxies in this mosaic. So to zoom in, there's interesting, weirdly shaped galaxies that we find in this mosaic. Um, that's a different representation and an optical Hubble Space Telescope image would be an elliptical galaxy that you see um, at the bottom right. There's all sorts of these weird galaxies, but you start seeing also those little dots that you would probably not say is a galaxy at all if you were just to see the image. And these dots are what we wanted because the deepest image wants to collect the furthest galaxies which live in the earliest universe. And all you get from those is basically a point source, a point of light. And from the point of light and other data that other colleagues have assembled in the optical and X-ray and the infrared regimes, you're supposed to deduce what kind of galaxy this is and how it contributes to the evolution of galaxies, etc. A lot of questions, a lot of technical work. So in this particular mosaic, there's almost 11,000 radio sources identified. And uh, we have spent some more years, probably, on uh, developing a new method to actually make sense of those dots of lights, to see which of those galaxies are actually actively forming new stars and which are actively growing their supermassive black holes. And given that the data set was beyond the state of the art, basically, it allowed us for the first time to uh, seek, to, to look into the universe 
um, when it was only about one billion years old. That's, that's really deep. So let me finish off this talk by showing a couple of slides about the outcomes and lessons learned from the project. So um, I think we even went beyond um, what we promised, what I promised uh, when writing the proposals. So altogether, we published eight data sets and made it available to the radio astronomy community in open access. Um, so basically, the legacy value of the project is that a team like ours works hard for years on such a data sets and puts out a catalog of galaxies in the end. A catalog of galaxies and their physical properties. And of course, we do our science on it and publish our papers on it and ask um, and answer the scientific questions of interest for our science purposes. But then we put out the catalogs to the public so anybody can use them to do their own science. And this is the legacy part of the project. So we published eight such big data sets. Overall, we published a lot of papers. Over 20 were led by the Career Integration Grant and DRC team members. And we did a lot of public outreach. And um, I have to say that prior to having this funding, um, I um, did not do a lot of public outreach. There was just not enough time. As a, postdoc, as a postdoc, you're forced to work so hard to publish a lot. Um, could you tell me how much more time I have? OK, good. <laughs> so as a postdoc, you're basically forced to be so productive to get your next postdoc and that, then to get a permanent position. And nobody, I had the impression, always values public outreach that much. You won't get a professorship because you do a lot of public outreach. You'll get a professorship because you publish a lot in highly ranked papers and if you publish important papers. Each EU project basically um, has a section on public outreach and it's very important if you want to get um, taxpayers' money um, funding that you do public outreach. So I had it in my project, I started doing it, and it opened a new world to me. <laughs> it was so um, much fun, I, I loved it. Um, and basically one also unexpected outcome of the project, and particularly the ERC, was the high media attention. I never expected that basically any newspapers would pick up on the project, and even less so that it would be covered so much in the um, uh, media as it was. So one of the unexpected, un at least to me unexpected outcomes was Astro Uccionica, which is an astronomy portal that I started throughout the project and continued working on, which is a web page um, at astrouccionica.hr with all the associated um, social media challenge, uh, channels. Um, where I put out astronomy texts, um, all sorts of astronomy texts, what's on the sky next month, um, people can, can learn about amateur telescopes and how to use them on that side, and there's a lot of articles on various scientific topics in Croatian. So the aim of this was to give to the general Croatian public, to children, but also, of course, to grown-up people who are interested in the topic but not scientists, a clear way of explaining in simple terms the complex things that we do, but in Croatian. There's a lot of, a lot of these such sites in English, but not really in Croatian. I love working on it. And um, from year to year, there's new ideas coming up with this portal. So in association with another association that I am um, part with, we also published some children's books. One, well, the other association is called Kako uh, Psi how dogs communicate. So we try to combine dogs with space. So one children's book is um, Dogs in Space, Psi u Svemiru, where um, we, in uh, children's accepted but also scientific way present um, the dogs that have been to space to pave the way to humans to travel to space. And another 
uh, children's book is Astro Kucharica, so for children who like dogs and like um, astronomy. Um, there's 12 recipes developed by Milenka Kuchar that are associated to astronomy themes and each recipe has a short explanation for children about the moon phases, about galaxies there, then cooking together. It was tremendous fun to work on those projects and I hope we'll have more of those. So, to get back to um, the projects and to the lessons learned. Um, it was tough. It was tough getting the data that were the basis of the EU projects that I got. It was tough getting the EU projects and it was maybe even tougher to lead the projects in Croatia um, at an institution that had no experience with leading ERC projects. And here I'm not even talking about the scientific challenges, which for ambitious projects you will always have to encounter, but the administrative problems, um, the team management problems, um, assuring that the team really has everything they need to be the most productive and to be happy, because <laughs> the happier the person, the more productive the person is. And um, throughout this, I think what really helped me is many seminars that I, in, that I attended during my career about um, topics that are very often referred to soft skills. So presentation skills, conflict management, team management, project management. So those are all skills that are essential to successfully lead ambitious projects such as any ERC. Um, yet I do have the impression that um, in the environment that I'm in now, that they are not as appreciated as they should be. So for example, at the Max Planck Institute, when somebody would apply for a grant, it didn't even have to be an ERC grant, it could be the German Eminuter grant, for example, and they would be called for an interview. It would be the full institute from the director to students that would assemble in the room for a prep talk, a prep interview. And those lasted sometimes for two hours, and it was not only one prep talk per um, grant before the interview, it was multiple. So th those sessions would last for two hours, and um, the people in, in the audience, uh, so the colleagues, would ask um, nasty questions. They would try to think to be very critical to prepare the candidates for the questions that, might, that they might get at the real interview. And even before so, before getting to the interview, a proposal of any colleague would be, written, would be read actually by other colleagues, by the ex-supervisor, for example, and by other colleagues who would help to improve um, the proposal, the science case, but also the textual part of the proposal. Plus, there was um, always a tendency um, to organize such soft skill seminars. So independent of any particular project that the scientists would um, apply for, um, the Max Planck um, and the European Southern Observatory, for example, always had some soft skill seminars that, uh, that they would suggest to you that you could attend as, um, in creation it would be doškolavanje, so as an extra um, schooling. Um, as an extra course where you could learn about things that are not necessarily science related but are really essential to lead projects because um, you are, as a scientist, basically getting into management when you start leading such a big project. So you better have some management skills and you better learn some management tools before you actually um, get into this challenge. So. I'll finish off this talk with something else that was completely unexpected to me in my career. And this is the sole trademanship I started, which among other things um, already has an online course available on how to write a successful ERC project. It, it offers consultations and the next thing that I will start are workshops for people that would like to apply for ERCs but also for scientific projects that I plan starting to organize. So thank you very much.
Yeah, it's working. Dear Professor Smolcic, thank you very much for this very inspirational talk before everything and congratulations on your success, both research and funding wise. And uh, I will open your talk for questions. So if anybody from the audience has a question, please do pose. And I will also use this opportunity to ask those who are following us online because we are hybrid, so we are followed online also to write a question on email that we have sent previously if they have any questions. This is valid due throughout the entire day, in fact. In fact. How long did you search for the group, finish your group? How much time did you spend to say that you were traveling and everything? So, so I don't have one answer for it yeah. because some postdocs were also changing. Um, in the first year of my career integration grant project, um, the PhD student Mladen was already working on the project. So he was the first one on the ERC project as well. Um, then the first postdoc came maybe one or two months um, after the start of the ERC project. Two months later, Jacinta from Australia joined us. In autumn, Ivan joined us. Um, and the year afterwards, the other two PhD students were hired. The postdoc said four-year contracts, so um, when the first left, another one was hired, so four years after the start of the project. So quite soon, I would say in the first year, I probably had more than half of the team or half of the team ready. So what happened with them afterwards? This is me speaking here. <laughs> When is I, <laughs> I can see you, but I heard I hear you. Sorry, okay, sorry. What, um, was the, what happened with your postdocs well, afterwards? I'm, I'm happy to say that they're all happy and successful. So, Oscari actually is the only one who left. Uh, no, he's not the only one. So, Oscari left astronomy. He went back to Finland and he's in the private sector. Mladen, the first PhD student, um, did his first postdoc in Heidelberg at the Max Planck. Institute and now he also left astronomy very recently and he moved to Cambridge to develop video games. Jacinta is a SKA fellow in South Africa. Ivan received a Marie Curie um, outgoing fellowship and now he has a permanent position in Italy, in Milano. He's originally Italian. And Kreshimir and Lana are um, our postdocs at the Institute, Ruger Boschkovic and the last postdoc got a fellowship in Spain. So very successful, yeah. Um, what about current, uh, your current grants? grants? Uh, did you get the grant from Creation Science Foundation or after these grants or you have European grants? I didn't apply for the Creation Science grants afterwards. Um, I have to admit that um, it was quite some tasks quite some task to lead the projects in Croatia and um, since their end I haven't applied for any science funding. I have a PhD student now in my group who is more than halfway through. Um, I'm part of somebody else's HRZZ uh, project and that's so far it. So um, I took it easier to relax a little bit after all the stress and you know double working time for years. Hi. I have a question about the timing of your Marie Curie and ERC. So they received them both at the same time, but and you started Marie Curie, but you didn't finish it, or? No, um, I had them in parallel for okay. three years, so I think. So that was possible? Uh, it is possible. Um, of course, you are not allowed to have, uh, to have double funding. Um, so when I wrote the project, I was very careful about how to really precisely define the tasks so that the the projects within both of them would be collaborative but not overlapping in such a way that it would be double funding. Any more questions? Oh, sorry. Hi, Vanessa. Um, what is the future of radio telescopy and in particular uh, keeping in mind uh, that we are easier going to space uh, by SpaceX uh, program or something like this? So we um, 
it's bright. <laughs> so the future projects that were only planned when I was writing my proposals are happening basically right now. So there is this big array um, divided between South Africa and Australia. Um, the very large array, the main telescope that I'm using is going through another upgrade which will be, um, well, it's planned, I'm not sure, in, in the next year, let's say in the next decade. And I'm pretty sure that one next big thing which I hope that I will see during my scientific life is an interferometer in space. So maybe a base on the moon or, you know, satellites in space that would um, collect the signals. Okay, so if we don't have any more questions, I would like to thank again to Professor Smolcic for giving us a beautiful lecture. And I will announce that we have a break until 3.